Okay, well, it's nice to see everybody today. Uh, I am uh, sorry it is such a dark and uh, rainy night here in Greer. Um, but uh, anyway, let me get started um, and talk about low cost uh, 3D printing for amateur radio. Um, so, a little bit about me. Um, who am I? My name is James Robinson. My call sign is Kilo November Zero Mike Echo Sierra uh, Gnomes. I was licensed in 2015. Uh, in my day job, I'm a software engineer. I write and design uh, software systems uh, for e-commerce applications and middleware uh, for uh, a consulting firm. Um, I've been 3D printing for about a year. Um, I have uh, thousands of hours on my 3D printers, uh, but I don't consider my ex myself an expert. I am not a robotics engineer. Um, I am not an electrical engineer. I'm not a mechanical engineer. Uh, but I know enough to get into trouble. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about this. So uh, here's a little overview of my presentation. Um, first, I'm going to be talking about what is 3D printing uh, and perhaps what it is not, uh, to uh, what we can do with it as amateur radio enthusiasts, um, how do you actually 3D print something and what software that entails. Uh, maybe you want one, so I'll talk about some hardware and uh, what can you print with it and that's your material, the stuff that goes in the thing. And then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some safety concerns and uh, draw a conclusion. Okay, so um, what is 3D printing? Uh, does anybody here own a 3D printer? Nobody. Have you all heard about 3D printing? So everybody's uh, heard about 3D printing, right? So um, according to the news outlets and online, the internet, you know, maybe you think you press a button, get a thing. So I'm guessing maybe you need a, one of these multifunction printers and you press a button and you can get a radio or some other item. You know, that's what they lead you to believe that you can do. Wow, that's so cool. Uh, so I, you know, I found other interesting things on the internet. Um, Gary and Dave will talk about uh, you're letting your smoke out. Well, guess what? I've, I found the smoke. You can put it back in when you let it out. Uh, you can buy this on the internet. So uh, if you really, really believe this, uh, I'm afraid that's not really what 3D printing is. So what is it? It's a noun. It's a process of action about taking, making a physical object from a digital model. So you have a, a digital file, some sort of material, a process to put that together in thin layers in succession and you build a thing apart. So uh, let's talk about radios. Let's talk about manufacturing and prototyping and all this fun stuff. And I brought my little radio here. This is a, a Baofeng. It's, it's inexpensive. If we look at our Baofeng and we look, go home and we look at our radios, you'll, you'll see, you know, it's, it's covered in plastic, right? They're no longer made from giant chunks of sheet metal. Um, and all these buttons and all this plastic housing and the battery compartment and the knobs and everything, this is all molded. It's all plastic injection molded. And this is where typically, you know, it's done. It's done in offshore. It's done in China. Uh, it's done with a mold like that. That's a, a mold for light housing. Uh, and it's a two pieces of metal and they inject plastic under pressure. And uh, there's cooling channels in that mold, and it'll cool it down, and the part will pop out, and it goes through an assembly line like that. That's a, that's a light. They're making a, a light housing. And uh, the part gets passed down the assembly line, and people you know, perform operations on it. And this is how this kind of thing gets made. Uh, not the electronics, you know, not the, the, the conductors, the resistors. Masters, ICs, but the, the physical case. So what else is there? Well, we've got molding, we've got something else called subtractive manufacturing. And this is, we take a block of material, we perform some operations on it, and we create a part and some waste. So this is another way to make a part. 
Um, you take a block of material, perform some cutting operations on it. We do this as amateur radio enthusiasts, right? We, if you've made a dipole, you've gone to the hardware store, you bought a piece of PVC pipe, you cut that PVC pipe up, you drilled some holes in it, you put some stuff in it, and you hung it from a tree. And that is, your, that, that, is, uh, that is subtractive manufacturing. All your tools in your workshop, your drills, your saws, your mills, your lathes, uh, you, you know, if you, that is all subtractive tooling. Um, so on the left picture there, that's, that's a, a gentleman making a Morse key knob. He, he's uh, turning a, uh, a blank and he's using a wood lathe to, to manufacture a knob. And on the right there, that's the constituent parts you'd start with for a dipole. So what's the opposite of subtractive manufacturing? Well, that's additive. So that's adding material to a build service to make a part. You build it up. You build it up in layers. And this is hardly a new idea. We've been doing this, you know, before we could read and write. You know, a primitive man would make pot clay pots out of a, you know, and use the build surface would be a piece of stone, and the material would be the clay, and the machine that would be building it would be your, the human being. So hardly a new idea. So what is a 3D printer? It's an additive manufacturing tool. It uh, adds material to a build surface, usually in thin layers, usually in plastics. It makes parts. Uh, I liken it to your own offshore factory uh, on your desktop. Uh, you can make your own plastic parts at home. So why? Why, why do we care? Why, why as an amateur radio operator, why, why, would you, why would you be interested in this? So um, I've got a few examples here. Um, but and they fit in two broad categories, either plastic parts for repairs or upgrades or some homebrew project that you may be uh, attempting. Because everybody's ham radio is different. Uh, my ham radio may be different from your ham radio. And uh, you know, Gary has told me in, in, in the class that ham radio is the best hobby in the world, and he's absolutely right. So uh, you know, my ham radio involves taking stuff apart and building things. So this is why I, I use my 3D printer. So uh, why, why, uh, how about knobs? This is an easy, logical first step. So here's a, a, a VFO knob for a, for a Kenwood TS440 uh, 3D printed object. So most of these items, I, uh, these, these objects, I, I've actually printed, but we're kind of spread out, so I, I'm not gonna pass them around. Um, but if you're interested, and I encourage, after the presentation, you wanna come up and look at all this stuff, I, I would encourage you to do so. Um, so uh, a knob for a Kenwood, uh, a knob for a Yesu, a mobile rig. You know, you got out of your truck, you, you snapped the knob off your radio, you lost it in the parking lot, you can print a new one. Um, so what about some old vintage parts? Um, so these are, uh, I, I have a book here from the 1940s, and I wanted to build an old um, regenerative radio and it called for a coil, a plug-in coil. And uh, if you uh, try to find one of these coils, like I, I thought the, 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 um, the vacuum tubes would be the difficult thing to find, right? You, you'd assume they don't make vacuum tubes anymore, right? So they're gonna be expensive. But you can find a vacuum tube no trouble. Those are about $6. There, there are plenty of surplus websites that will sell you a vacuum tube. But it's those plug-in coils I found one on eBay and the gentleman wanted $60 for a plug-in coil. So that was a bit much for me. So um, what can we do? Well, there's a, there's a ham radio operator out of uh, Sierra Mike Zero, Victor Papa Oscar, a gentleman by the name of Harry in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And he has a website and on that website, he has instructions to how to build these plug-in coils, all kinds of plug-in coils, you got charts with how to wind them and what inductances they'll be, and you can put together um, a 3D printed plug-in coil, which is pretty cool, and he's open sourced it, and he provides you the models, and you can, you can make these yourself with your 3D printer. So what about uh, parts for other radios? So the Baofeng, the UV5R, um, I actually went on before, I went on Thingiverse website and looked up to see how many parts there were now. There was actually 115, so up from 93. Uh, different 3D printable parts for your Baofeng. So 
So everything from like an Arduino backpack to a, uh, a 18650, an 18650 cell is a, is a, looks like a fat, long double A. It's a, it's a lithium ion, 3.7 volts, around three amp, uh, three amp hours. Um, you can make yourself a battery pack. You can make yourself a cup holder. You can make yourself the knobs, the case, the plugs, all these parts of the Baofeng you can 3D print. So that's pretty cool. Um, so what about your homebrew projects? Well, um, this is a Pixie transceiver. Uh, it's a low cost. It runs you about $4. It's a transmitter and a receiver for $4. Um, CW only, so you're going to have to learn code. <laughs> Uh, 40 meters, um, it's about 200, 300 milliwatt, so QRP or micro, uh, micro QRP, Pico QRP. Um, but you can make yourself a nice little case for your, your Pixie. Um, so what other enclosures? So this is me, I, I, I bought a oscillator, code practice oscillator kit. Uh, it, it didn't uh, come with a case. So I can uh, fire up CAD and design and build myself an enclosure. Um, radios, you can make some primitive um, crystal radios with the electronics, uh, of course just coils and a, and a, and a diode and a crystal, um, but you can, you can build these things with your 3D printer. Um, how about some antennas? So you can build yourself uh, your Yagis, um, your beam support for your, your elements on your Yagis, your uh, dipole center for your, you know, whatever dipoles you want to make. Uh, and this actually does work. So this is one I, 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 I've built. This is a 3D printed ball and box and a center support. Uh, I didn't do the electrical wiring, but I printed it and gave it to somebody and they assembled it and there it is up in a tree. So it is pretty cool. You can make them lightweight and small and, and they're very efficient. What about a, a, a rotator? So there's this group called uh, uh, Space Lieber Foundation, and uh, they have a project called SatNogs. It's an open source uh, satellite tracking um, software and hardware, and part of their, part of their uh, kind of body of work is this rotator. And I have, uh, I, I've been intrigued by it, and I, I've actually constructed it here, and this is a, uh, mostly, uh, well, 15 3D printed parts, the entire gear train and gear assembly is all 3D printed. And it'll run you about $220. Um, so what about QST? Uh, I don't know, this is the November uh, 2018 QST. There's this really cool project about building your own uh, watt meter. And as part of that uh, dummy load and watt meter, you can 3D print uh, a nice cover for the box, so which has the holes for the, the uh, LCD and the, uh, the switches. So, uh, and the authors of QST will provide you with the, the STL files to print that. So, and you know, of course you can design your own stuff. You can, you can build a Morse key, build whatever you want in CAD. So, that maybe you're interested. Now let's talk about how it actually this happens. So I break it down into three phases. Uh, you need to get your part, or you get your object, you need to do something called slice it, and then you'll need to actually print it, where you can then profit from your hard work. Um, so what is it? What, what is this 3D object? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a secret here about um, computer 3D. So your video games, your, 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 your movies, your CGI effects in your movies, your, uh, you know, your Xbox, your, your you know, games, your uh, special effects, all of this boils down to one thing. And these, these 3D files, the, this 3D object boils down to the same thing, and it's triangles. When you're looking at, a, a, at your video game, what you're seeing, it gets broken into lots and lots of triangles. And this is no different. This, this 3D object is an STL file. This is what most 3D printers take. It's also kind of colloquially, colloquially called a mesh. But what it is is it's triangles. It's triangular geometry. Now even the, some of the big boy CNC machines that might be making your, your, um, your engine blocks and your, your cam shafts, and they're taking the same 
same geometries. So um, this is what it kind of looks like. You, you start with a physical object, say a 10 millimeter sphere, and then you'll start to approximate it with, with triangles. So everything is approximate. Um, when you have a hole, that hole is going to be facets. When, this thing, when, a, when a 3D printer prints something, it's not going to be a perfect round hole. It's going to be a series of facets. So uh, that Nate Yesu knob, this is what that thing actually looks like visualized with all those triangles. You thought it was round. It's not really round. It's got many thousands of triangles. So how do you get this? Uh, oh, actually, um, that's what it looks like. If you decode the file, you'll see a series of vertices. And that's what's actually in that file right there, the, the, that Yesu knob. It, it, it is a series of facets, and these facets have got three vertices with X, Y's, and Z's. It's all triangles. So how, how do you get one of these things? Well, you, there's two ways. You can download them, and that's easy, or you can make one yourself. So I'll, I'll tell you how. Um, downloading. Uh, you go to a website, and here's a few. Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, CG Trader. There's a ton more. You just, uh, so how do you do that? You, you put it in your browser. So this is a, uh, a center support for a spider beam antenna uh, that you can 3D print, and I've highlighted the download button. That's all you do. You click that button, you got your spider beam uh, center support, you send it to your printer with the next step. So how else can you do this from downloading it? Uh, you can make your own 3D model. Um, and to do that, you'll need CAD software. So thankfully, CAD software is free. Uh, CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. Um, this could be an entire uh, course at university in of itself just to learn how to you know, design stuff in CAD. But you can play with it. And there's tons of tutorials on YouTube and other places. But here's a few uh, CAD software. It's Autodesk Fusion 360. This guy is an is a, is a industrial quality piece of software like Fusion 360, um, big uh, cam CAD shops that are milling things out of aluminum and you know, making parts for aircraft, that kind of thing. They're using that, that Fusion 360. So Fusion 360 is normally paid, but if you download the demo and install it and go through the registration part, there's a little drop down and you can choose startup or enthusiast license. And as long as you are using it for yourself, or you plan to let, make less than $100,000 using their software, you can use Fusion for free. So uh, that's I, I, my demonstration. I'll, I'll show you a few um, designs in Fusion. Um, there's plenty of other open source, FreeCAD, Tinkercad. Uh, there are many, many other uh, CAD software out there. Okay, so this is uh, something I've built. Um, I, I went to a ham fest and I picked up an old uh, WT-8 amp military Morse key and it had the finger rest was broken. It was missing, it snapped off. So um, I wanted to make a finger rest. I wanted to make a new knob for my, my Morse key. So how did I do it? Well, in Fusion, you can take a photograph, you, you just use my camera my, my phone and I snapped a little picture of my, my Morse key knob and I uh, imported it into Fusion into a two-dimensional plane and then I sketched it. I, I scaled it with a pair of uh, calipers and I just sketch it. You just sketch the profile, right, as a two-dimensional drawing. And to get it to 3D, all you have to do is re like revolve it around a y-axis and then you're done. You have a 3D object, you know, baby's first uh, CAD object. Right click, save as STL, and you're done. You have a, you have a 3D printable thing. And, I, and I've actually done it and printed it out, and you can see it. So, um, so why? Uh, now we've got a 3D object. Either you've downloaded it or you've made it yourself. Now you need to do something called slicing. So a 3D printer like mine right up here has a, a microcontroller on board. It's got firmware. This is, microcontroller is not like your Windows PC, right? It's not running an operating system. You don't have a mouse and a keyboard. 
it needs some instructions. It doesn't know what to do with all those triangles. You need to tell it exactly what to do. All that microcontroller can do is move those motors, heat the heater up, you know, turn the fan on. It doesn't know what you intend to do with a 3D, that 3D object file that you've got. That, that, that uh, 3D, so you need a way to turn that 3D object file into instructions for your 3D printer. And that's your second step. So you've got a 3D object file, now you need to turn it into instructions. So how you do that is with a slicer. And that slicer software takes that SDL and cuts it into layers and generates G code. What G code is is the instructions for the th 3D printer. Um, the slicer is CAM, it, it's computer aided machining. Um, the software is free, there's plenty of examples. Uh, Cura, Slicer with the E being a three, uh, Repetier, um, there's, a, there's a ton more. So just like that vegetable slicer, that's what it's doing but in a virtual sense. So how do you do this? Well that's what it looks like. There's my, uh, there's my Morse key knob in a slicer. Uh, you, it's a free download. You uh, got your STL file, you open it, you import it into your, your uh, slicer, and uh, you define the parameters that you want it to use. How high the layers need to be, how much infill you want, how thick, solid the part needs to be, how many walls, how many, uh, how many uh, the, the top and the bottom, how thick you want these things, the temperature, the material type, and uh, you select these parameters and you press that button. Oop. So uh, this is what it looks like vi visualized, uh, you know, with uh, I think that's four perimeters and 20% uh, infill. Um, and you press that button and you get the G code. You don't need to know it, you don't need to look at it, that's what it looks like though. And it's just a series of moves for the motors. Um, so now you have the G code, you can send it to your printer. Um, and I don't know if my video is going to work, but I'm just going to keep going. So here's a little overview. You're going to need CAD, uh, CAD software and, uh, uh, or a model that you've downloaded, uh, which will give you your STL file. You'll feed that into your slicer software, your CAM software, which generates your G code. You send your G code to your printer and you get your part. So let's talk a little bit about the technology behind all this. So there are different types of pre printers just like there are different types of regular printers. Um, they have different properties. So like a uh, thermal receipt printer, you wouldn't want to try to print a photograph on that. I mean you could, I guess. It wouldn't look very good. but. <laughs> So uh, we've got different types of 3D printers. Um, I'm just going to talk to uh, talk to you about a, a few of the big big uh, varieties out there that you can buy desktop versions for. Um, first one will be SLS. This stands for Selective Laser Centered. It uses a laser and some powdered material. Um, then you have SLA uh, or DLP. Uh, they're they're very similar. That uses a liquid plastic resin. It's UV reactive and a UV laser or a UV projector to cure that plastic. And then finally an FDM or a FFF, uh, this stands for fused filament fabrication or fused deposition modeling. They're, they're interchangeable and in that you're using a spool of filament and you're melting that spool or melting that filament. So let's talk about SLS, it's got freaking laser beams. So how an SLS uh, printer works, um, it's got a powder delivery system and you roll out some powder in a fine layer and then you use a laser and you melt that. Well, you don't actually get it to melting temperature. You use the pressure and the heat to fuse those powder particles. So um, you can buy these uh, desktop versions. They're still very pricey. So Form Labs has a fuse one, which is about 10 grand. Uh, Sensor it um, has one. It's about eight grand. They're accurate, strong parts. They're fast. Of course, they're expensive, and you in these desktop versions, you're using 
powdered nylon. You're using a powdered plastic. Now I actually do have a, a laser centered part up here. This is a this is a laser centered gear component. So if you want to come up and look at that um, at the end, you're more than welcome to. Um, this is what it looks like at the end when you, when you when you undo that build chamber. You'll find some parts in a big old block of compressed powder. And usually they shake that on the table and vibrate it and recycle the powder and reclaim their parts. So uh, have you all seen this on the TV with the, uh, the, the five second fix and the laser bond and I had to put Billy Mays up there just because. Um, it's this uh, UV plastic in a, in, a, in, a, in a pen where you squirt it out, you use a little LED to harden it. And a dentist use something similar with your, with your fillings. So this is what SLA, the next technology, is based on. So uh, it uses a photoreactive plastic in a, in a tank um, and uh, it, it cures that plastic with a laser. Um, DLP is similar but it uses a projector instead of a laser. So uh, high strength, accurate, these are, these are great uh, if you're going to do modeling, like model railroad or miniatures or that sort of thing. Uh, it's got a high, high resolution, um, you, but you're limited. Uh, you're using a liquid plastic. Uh, you're going to need probably uh, a separate light box to further cure the part, depending upon your, your, your material. Uh, you, you may need an ultrasonic cleaner and isopropyl alcohol to clean the part because it's going to be gooey and full of resin. But uh, these are actually uh, reasonably priced. Uh, the Form Labs Form 2, about three grand. Uh, PO Poly Maui is about 1,300. And you can buy Chinese uh, offshore clones for around $600. And I do have a, 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 this little battery box here. Is a, uh, is a from Form Labs and it is a uh, uh, SLA printed part. So you can come and look at that. So uh, this is what it looks like in the tank um, with the laser and it's pulling the part from the bottom of the tank up. And the laser just scans and does its thing each layer by layer. So uh, this leads me to the last technology I'm going to talk about, the FDM and the FFF, the fused filament fabrication or the fused deposition model modeling. Um, this is the most common technology used in consumer and hobby 3D printers. Um, it uses a heated extruder and plastic in a filament or a spool of filament and it deposits it layer by layer using the heat to fuse the plastic to the previous layer. I liken it to scribbling with a crayon. <laughs> so uh, here's a little diagram. You, you've got the, the, the print head that moves in various directions and it'll uh, deposit the, uh, the, part, the, the plastic and build your model up. So I, I can't mention uh, FDM without mentioning RIPRAP. Um, so these two gentlemen uh, and, and their team, uh, Dr. Adrian Boer and Vic Oliver, and they're at uh, Bath University in England and, and their team, um, created a, a project called RIPRAP, which stands for Replicating Rapid Prototyper. Um, it's an FDM printer. Uh, they, they call it FFF uh, because of copyright and uh, patent issues with the word FDM. But it, the whole goal was to make a low-cost 3D printer at the university. And this started in 2005. So this is what it looked like. This is the first riprap machine, uh, Darwin. Uh, in 2006, uh, it's, uh, they, so when they built it at their university, they, be, it may, they made it open source and open hardware. They published everything. They made it a freely available. And this is the granddaddy of most of the commercial and hobbyist uh, 3D printers. And their design was such that it encouraged evolution. It encouraged people to, to take their ex designs and, and kind of add into it. So um, there's the very first end user 3D printed part, which was an iPod mount, because it's the internet and people upload things. We know roughly about when these, when these uh, uh, things were created. So uh, somebody in April 14th, uh, 2008, 
created a, a iPod mount for their Ford Fiesta to mount uh, their iPod to their the coin tray on their uh, on the, on their uh, their car. So this led to uh, you know as the universities are and they they improved their designs. Um, the second generation Mendel and Mendel added uh, a modular carriage and it was both capable in printing both in plastic and soldering and the idea being that it could do circuit boards. Not only make parts out of plastic, but solder and put together circuit boards. So, uh, and then we advance further into 2012 when we get Huxley, that's the Rip Rap's uh, third generation. And uh, the mantra was manufacturing for the masses. And this is where it started to catch on with hobbyists, because now you can make all kinds of plastic goods for yourself. So, um, and then we see the evolution between uh, kind of a research project and, and a hobby and a tool and a commercial thing, commercial, uh, commercially available, that you don't have to, you know, buy threaded rod and fit it together yourself. So, you can see the kind of the evolution where, where Huxley ends up into a, a commercial 3D printer and how it's laid out. So, and this is where we are kind of today. Uh, yes, that's Dremel. That is a Dremel brand 3D printer. Uh, and that other photo there, that's uh, at an Aldi's. Uh, and it, it's not in the US, I'm afraid, but that, is, that was a picture uh, of, a, of an Aldi's in um, Australia, where they actually had 3D printers for sale in the Aldi's, right, you know, right next to the, uh, you know, apples and oranges, I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, 3D printer is, uh, FDM technology that you've seen is, is the only um, technology that uses production grade thermoplastics. So the same kind of plastics that you encounter in your everyday life, you can use into this 3D printer. Um, the software, the firmware that runs on that microcontroller uh, is on 90% of all other FDM printers out there from the original uh, as it designed by the RipRap project. So, um, and I have a kind of a naive rule about low cost 3D printers. Uh, if it's less than $1,000, you're going to be buying a little bit of a project. You, you're you're going to have to put it together. It's maybe going to be a kit and you're gonna to have to calibrate it. And if it's an offshore kit, um, you're going to struggle a little bit with, with support. Um, Chinese manufacturers, when they produce these kits, um, they don't have much in the way of support. They, they don't, um, you're gonna to have to rely on the community. Um, so with these FDM printers, there's a huge variety of price ranges. Uh, you know, a MakerBot replicator, 2,500 uh, bucks. A Prusa i3 Mark III in kit format is going to be about 750. Or my example here that I brought along to show is a Creality Ender 3, and that's around 200. But that is a kit printer. And what do I mean by kit printer? That's what I mean by kit printer. It's a kit. It's going to be a, on the left there. That's a TiVo tarantula. On the right there, that is what that printer came in in the box. A uh, bunch of aluminum extrusions. Maybe stuff is partially assembled. The power supply is going to be put together. You know, you're you know you might have a, a board mounted in a box, but you're going to have to connect cabling. You're going to have to build it, fit parts together. Uh, it's doable in an afternoon. It's, a, it's about a three, four hour project. Uh, but you're going to be responsible for building it. So uh, let's talk about a little bit about the parts on, this, on these uh, FDM printers. Um, so you got uh, the key components. So the first, the, the, the business end is, is really the extruder. Um, that's in, in two parts in my, in my mind, a, a hot end which is the nozzle, the, the, the heater. The, it's a cartridge plug resistive heating element. Uh, it'll have a thermistor or a thermal couple to regulate its temperature. 
And I actually have a, uh, I brought in a, uh, one that you can come and look at because that one's going to be hot. So that's what it looks like. Um, and you're going to have a cold end, which in my mind is everything, ba everything that's not hot is <laughs> <It's> cold. <laughs> so that's your, your, your extruder, your, your direct, your, and there's two varieties of this. Uh, there's a direct drive, which you mount the uh, motor right immediately onto the extruder or onto the hot, uh, the heat brake. Or you've got a Bowden setup where the motor is detached and it's running, pushing plastic through a tube. So there's benefits to both of these designs. Um, the Bowden tube, you've moved that heavy motor off that carriage. So you've got a little bit more, little more accuracy. Uh, with that additional mass when you try to stop that motor, you're going to have ringing. You, you're going to have little perturbations of, of motion. Um, but the direct drive gives you more flexibility about what materials that you may or may not struggle to get to force through that Bowden tube. So there are pros and there are cons. So uh, you'll have a microcontroller, and, and I actually brought one. Um, this is a uh, Arduino, and it's a accompanying uh, ramps board. And this is the brains of a 3D printer, just these two little pieces. This will have your, this will plug into the, the Arduino, and this will, this has all your, uh, your uh, stepper motor drivers to turn your motors, and your MOSFETs to switch heaters and that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes these are in two parts, like the riprap, that's a riprap uh, ramps board. Uh, ramps stands for riprap Arduino Mega Pololu Shield. And Pololu is a uh, electronics manufacturer uh, company, and those little drivers are in Pololu format. Um, Shield is a, if you're not sure if you're familiar with an Arduino, but Arduinos will have these modules that you can plug in on top of the microcontroller, and they call them shields. Um, Riprap, you've seen the, 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 uh, the, the university project. Um, and Arduino Mega is the type of microcontroller. Um, so you have your linear motion, your X, Y, Z axis. Uh, basically, a 3D printer is a Cartesian robot. It, typically, you'll have uh, timing belts in your X and Y and you'll have a lead screw in your Z. You get your resolution, your, your detail is in your Z. Uh, because the nozzle is your detail for your X and Y, and you, that you're limited to, usually they come with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So you're, you're scribbling a 0.4 millimeter line. Uh, but your Z axis, depending on your printer, this will be, be all your details. So if you've got a detailed part, you orientate it with a detail going up. Uh, on an inexpensive printer like this Ender, uh, realistically 100 micron, 0.1 millimeter accuracy or, or detail, resolution is the word, in the Z-axis. Um, both of these are, all these motors are stepper motors. Um, and they dri they'll drive the pulleys and the lead screw. And then finally you'll have a build surface and usually that build surface is a heated bed. It's a, it's a resistive heated a PCB that's laminated on a piece of aluminum and usually you layer like a piece of glass or a piece of PEI polyamorid uh, plastic on top of that which is what you can print on. Um, the difficult thing about an FDM printer is your calibration. The, uh, the inexpensive printers, uh, especially with the Chinese ones, you're going to find maybe the bed is warped and that'll, that'll become the bane of your existence when you get a warped bed. You can mitigate that with just buying a piece of glass. Nice, spend the twenty dollars, buy a nice flat piece of glass if you've got a warp bed. So that'll solve your problem. Okay, so now we're talking about materials. So you kind of know what a three D printer is and kind of how it works. Um, what do you put in it? So this is a, uh, a, a an extruder extruder to make filament. It, it uses plastic pellets and it melts it and extrudes it to a, a nominally precise diameter depending upon the quality of the filament. So there are different types of plastic. Oh, the stock. You can talk about the stock. 
the stock used by a 3D printer. It's typically sold on a one kilo spool, about 2.2 pounds. It's usually si it's sized for your hot end, so there are different sizes of hot end. Most consumer hot ends that you'll buy are usually 1.75 millimeters. There are bigger. This lets you push more plastic. You're usually a bigger, bigger printer. You're building bigger parts. Um, and it comes in a spool, and it, the spool looks just like that. That's a spool. Looks like fishing line, or weed eater line, somebody told me. And I'm not sure what happens if you put weed eater, <laughs> weed eater line through one of these. Don't ask me. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the different material. Um, this is perhaps, the, 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 if you're going to want to, if you're going to start in 3D printing, I'd recommend you get a spool of PLA to start with. Uh, PLA stands for polylactic acid. It's made from sugar, uh, uh, either uh, corn, if it's made in the U.S., or usually sugar beets or uh, some other uh, plant um, if it's made in China. It's found in tea bags, mulch, film, cups, etc. Uh, it's very easy to print. It's runny. It, it, it's a good, inexpensive plastic. It's also biodegradable. So, uh, you know, when you make a mess and you, your part doesn't come out like you wanted it to, you can just biodegrade it. And that's under ideal conditions. That's what the PLA uh, biodegradation looks like. It needs UV light, it needs moisture, acidity, and all these work together to degrade the plastic. But it's perfectly good. I, I, I printed all my boxes and stuff in PLA. It is brittle, however, and not good for outside. Like I said, UV degrades it. So the other big uh, plastic out there is ABS, uh, acronitrile butadiene styrene. Uh, it's made from oil. Uh, I believe you do not go through a day without encountering and touching something made of ABS plastic. Uh, it's used in everything from Lego bricks to car parts, everywhere. ABS plastic is, is everywhere. It's tough, it's impact resistant. Um, it is a bit more tricky to work with than uh, regular PLA. Uh, it has a tendency to warp. Um, that uh, rotator, all that green, is, is ABS. Uh, so, but the price on that is about $25 a spool. Um, it's, this printer, the sender, is, is more than capable of printing uh, ABS. So, um, Another one you might find is PET or PETG, polyethylene tetraphthalate gly or glycol modified. It's a polyester. Um, it has the benefits of both PLA and ABS. It's 100% recyclable, uh, and it has all the benefits of ABS and some of the of, of PLA. Um, it has no odor. Um, it's, a, it's a good plastic. It might be a little tricky, but I, I found it easy to print with. Um, and then you get all kinds of other plastics, nylons, polycarbonates, um, ASA, polypropylenes, flexibles, rubbers, thermal uh, TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane. Um, there's a 3D printed car jack. Not that it's a good idea. I wouldn't want to put that in my, my truck to try to lift my truck up with it. But it, you know, the, the manufacturer is showing you how tough their plastics are. Uh, and then you get composites. So not only can you take one of these base plastics, you can add other stuff to it. Um, I actually brought in a, 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 some, some wood fill. It's about 80% wood. And you can sand it and stain it and change the color of it and do all kinds of fun stuff with it. Not really related to amateur radio unless you wanted to make up 3D printed wood box. Um, so, you know, metal filled, uh, you know, copper, bronze, Steel, iron, some of this can even be fired and centered if you happen to have a kiln. Um, ceramics, you can even do conductive filament, and there's a, a, a conductive filament, a dual head extruder. So the extruder will have, the 3D printer will have two heads, one to do a non conductive and one to do a conductive. And you can actually print conductive pathways into your part. Um, there is a resistance, however, and that resistance will depend on the brand and they usually use graphene. It's a plastic with graphene in it. Uh, and it varies between 22 ohms and some other higher value. 
Um, you can get glass filled, so fiberglass, little tiny pieces of fiberglass, or carbon fiber. Um, so you can print yourself a, a you know, a, a super lightweight and strong, you know, dipole that you can take backpacking and throw up in a tree or, or Yagi parts. Um, so now let's talk about some of the safety concerns. Um, this is a picture from the news. Uh, it's an Australian uh, from, the, from uh, Australia. Uh, the gentleman here, I believe, started a 3D printer and uh, went to work, a 15-hour print, and then went to work and left it alone. And uh, got, I presume, got a, got a call from the fire department and said, your house is on fire. Uh, 3D printing, it, it, the biggest risk is it, it's a fire hazard. You're, you're dealing with something that's hot. So here's another printer. Um, this one, I, I, I found this, this picture was off a Reddit thread on 3D printing. Uh, this is an A8, or what's left of it. Um, I believe the, somehow the, the, the hot end, I think, uh, got detached from the carriage and fell onto the part, and then it ignited. The difference between this one and the last one is the gentleman, the person behind this was home. And the reason why it looks like a black and white photo is he managed to put it out with a fire extinguisher. So, uh, Hot end is hot. Uh, some of these plastics will sustain a flame, and it's a fuel, so you need to be aware of that. So, uh, and you know, especially with some of the uh, the offshore printers uh, and the kits, uh, electrical safety is a concern. Uh, they may underrate components. You got to be when you assemble it, use an eye, see if that connector is that is that connector does it look does it look reasonable? You know. D d um, you know, just, just use your common sense when you build one. Um, firmware is a big concern for some printers. Uh, the Marlin firmware has what's called thermal runaway protection, uh, which is they, they read from the thermistor and it'll know if there's a problem, like if it keeps sending current to a heater and it doesn't see the temperature rising on a thermistor, does it abort? Does it turn off the printer and throw up an error and say, you know, help, uh, you know, I, I can't heat this up? Or does it keep throwing current and that thermistor never, you know, the wires are broken and it keeps pushing current and it, does it burn itself up? Does it catch fire? So that's what I mean by thermal runaway protection. So, you know, upgrade your thermware. Um, and kit printers, if you bought a kit, did you build it right? You know, did you tighten all those nuts and bolts and screws um, so, to mitigate some of this, you, you put your, your printer on non-flammable service, like on a metal bench, and you remove any combustibles. You know, don't have a, an entire stash of filament stacked up right next to your printer, you know, because that's just fuel to a fire. You, you don't want to do that. Don't leave it unattended. There's ways to monitor it. Put a fire extinguisher nearby put a fire alarm nearby, preferably a monitored fire alarm. If you can, stick a webcam on it. If you have to walk away from it and sit upstairs and watch television, have an app, they, they'd make apps for your phone. You can keep an eye on the printer uh, while it's doing 15 hours worth of work uh, without, keeping a, not, without physically being in the room with it. Um, fire alarms, you know, that, that's paramount. Um, and some of the plastics, give off fumes and you'll want to be well ventilated. You don't want to put, depending upon what you're printing, you don't want to put it in your living space. And that's up to your common sense. So in, in summary, um, all the software is free. Your, your 3D models are free. Your slicer software is free. Your CAD software is free. And uh, a 3D printer can had, be had for not a lot of money. You can get into it for about 200, 250 bucks. And you can get a kit and build it yourself and buy yourself a spool of plastic. And you just have to be not to be afraid and not to be afraid of learning something and not to be afraid of failure because you'll learn from those mistakes. You'll learn from your failures. If you got things right all the time, you wouldn't learn anything. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Gary, uh, Tom, and, and Dave Ivey, and, and my dad, M Melvin. Uh, and uh, there's my email. If you, if you do decide to get into 3D printing, 
uh, feel free to write it down and send me a message and send me an email if you need any help or advice or, you know, I'll, uh, for what it's worth. Your, your mileage may vary. But thank you. So. And you can come up and look at the little pieces and look so at the furniture. Oh, um, well, you wait it for it to cool down a little bit, and then you just use a paint scraper, like a sharp edge, and you, you, can, you can pop it off. Uh, it's, it's, this has got a PEI sheet on there, and it sticks to that pretty well. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you'll use glue stick to try to stick these down. Hairspray is common. So the bed is hot? Yes, the bed is heated. Yeah. What's the best uh, uh, material for uh, UV resistance? Um, I would, for, if you're going to do something outdoors, I would recommend either ABS or PETG. Um, I've used them both. Um, PLA will work. PLA is brittle. So in like a load type application, like an antenna pulling on it, it, it may crack. Um, but it, even PLA will last a little while. But in our South Carolina heat, uh, your, your ABS and PETG. If you look, depends on your longevity. Um, but it is, you know, it is uh, 3D printed and you can always print two, you know, or three, have some spares. So, anyway, uh, any other questions? So, yeah. on the, the antenna rotator? Yes. Did you have to do a, any or a lot of hand finishing on the, like, the gear parts? Yes, you do. Um, now, there are ways to finish 3D parts. Um, ABS is fantastic because you can do something called uh, chemical vapor bath. And what you take, it, it sounds fancy, it's just a paint can with a rag of acetone in it. And you dangle the part in it and it will smooth it and it will make it glass smooth. And it takes about, depending on the temperature, maybe 30 minutes and you can then just pull it out. You'll have to let it overnight or re-harden, but the acetone's a solvent for ABS, and you can get, um, you can, you could, of course, sand it, but um, it's a very slick way of finishing, getting out those layer lines, making it perfectly smooth. Chemical vapor bath. But, yeah. Well, like, well, like this year. Um, it, it's fairly easy, actually. Um, a lot of the parts are fairly common. Um, you can buy them on Amazon. I, I actually destroyed my heater on that printer, and I had to, I bought a replacement. Um, it, it, it was relatively cheap. It was maybe seven dollars. The, the parts, uh, a variety of of. Um, manufacturers are making them. In, in fact, it's got to the point where at least this printer and other printers, other Chinese co companies are knocking off Chinese companies. Yeah. So you're, you're finding knockoffs of knockoffs of knockoffs. It, it, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Are hard, easy to get to if they yeah, yeah. Um, just four, 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 four screws. They're all external. Yeah, a Amazon. Um, there, there's. Uh, uh, a variety of, of websites. Um, Tiny Machines is a US based company. Um, ZYL Tech, they provide, they make parts to build your own and they say you sell you aluminum extrusion by the yard. Um, and they'll sell motors and spark fun. So yeah. basically, the first thing you need to print are replacement parts for your printer. Uh, and you can. <laughs> You can. Um, all the white parts on that, I, I've, I've printed. Uh, um, you know, and there, a lot of these parts will wear out. Like I, I've heard that the later versions of this Ender, they've used plastic um, gears on the stepper motors that are pressed on, which is kind of a bummer. Like my version had set screws and metal gears, so you may end up buying. You know, I'll set all the gears and then hammering off or pulling off the, the pl cheap plastic gears if they break on you. Um, there's all sorts of like aftermarket kits. Like on my printer here, I've got a sensor. This is by TH3D Studios. This is a uh, leveling, bed leveling sensor. So if you don't have a bed leveling sensor, you've got to calibrate this thing with a sheet of paper and use these little thumb wheels here to level that bed. So it's, you know, 
level here, level here, level in the front, level in the back. But with this little sensor, this takes away some of that manual leveling. And it's a kit, you know, the aftermarket kind of, if you will. But all this is open source. Like you can find the circuit diagrams. You can find the source code for the, the firmware. Or you can modify it yourself. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's all, a lot of this is open. Now the Dremel 3D printer, probably not so much. Your, your Dremel 3D printer is, is probably proprietary. You know, and there are pr 3D printers out there that have proprietary spools that, that, that you, know, you have to buy their plastic to get in their special spool carrier to fit in. You know. It's like uh, if you ever bought toner for a laser printer and you can buy knockoff toner, like don't, I don't know if, you, if, if I'm blowing anybody's mind here, you don't have to buy HP toner for an HP printer. Uh, you can buy, uh, you know, other, you know, remanufactured toners for a fraction of the price. It, it, it's, it's similar, you know, you'll have uh, 3D printers that'll have a proprietary carriage. This isn't proprietary, this is just a, a spool of plastic. And Amazon, I mean, Amazon.com now has their own brand of 3D printer, 3D printer filament. Amazon Basics 3D printer filament. So you can, you know, buy that and it's about 15 to 20 bucks a spool. It's fairly decent stuff. Uh, this TPU, a little flexible. This is an, uh, flexible. You can bend the benchy boat. Uh, this is an Amazon brand rubber. So, um, and the reason why I have little benchy boats, these are benchy benchmark boats. So each machine is going to be different. Each, you know, tolerances, tolerances stack. You know, when you buy like an electronics kit and they say that resistor's got a 5% tolerance or your, 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 your uh, you know, your capacitors or, you know, all your electronic parts and all this, tolerances stack. And same with the 3D printer where your heater is going to be slightly different, your thermistor is going to be different. So if you bought one and I bought one, what we, you know, and the filament may be slightly different, one recipe that I have to print this may be slightly different from your recipe. So what I do is I print these little boats and I make note of what my settings were. And these, this is a benchmark. It, it's a torture test for a 3D printer. So you're printing out in space, right? You're printing, you know, these complex curves and it's a, it's a sh quick, easy to print. Well, it's a torture test, so it's not, really, not easy on the printer. But it takes, you know, 45 minutes to print-ish, maybe an hour and a half, depending upon speed and parameters. But it lets you judge your, your, your changes. So before you try to print, you know, fill, because you can fill this bed up with parts, right? You can print, you can keep loading stuff in that slicer and load 20 parts. And just fill the bed up and, and have it run for three days. Um, before you do that, you want to make sure your settings are good. And that's what the Menchie boats are for. So this is PLA. I've got some wood fill here. And you can actually see the wood in the, in the filament. That's a little wooden benchy boat. So anyway, you, you can, anyway, any more questions? No? Well, it's nice, thank you for all coming.